Let's look first. Get a copy in the network folder. Copy it to your flash drive. I'll turn the printer on in a moment, but copy the blogging checklist <coughs> handout. So campus blogging WordPress checklist. I would use this handout in my blogging class, which we spend four weeks talking just about blogging. I'm going to give you the short answer with this handout. Um, the full details would be in the class. Well, this is a, this is a checklist. Concepts you need to know when writing long-form content. It's a fancy way of saying blogging. So, this class we've used WordPress to create a website focused on e-commerce. But I've been saying that you also need to engage in marketing to get traffic to this e-commerce site you've built. You're going to need to then engage in some blogging, writing articles. So I have these big ideas. A section of planning, writing, and then promoting. So the first section is about planning what you're going to do, what you're going to write, what you're going to create. So I have here decide on hosted versus self-hosted. We've covered that in terms of there's WordPress.com and there's WordPress.org. I've already covered that idea. WordPress.com is okay to get started as training wheels, but we spent the time to create a WordPress.org version a version that eventually you upload to your Bluehost or your GoDaddy or whatever. So you could create a blog at WordPress.com or Blogger.com or even LinkedIn or Facebook and use that as the place that you're writing your blogs at. But I would recommend the self-hosted, which is the one that you set up yourself at Bluehost, HostMonster, etc. You're going to need to write content on a regular basis, which we'll see how much in a moment here. You need to develop a series concept and variety. You can get the example like here. I like to show this example site. If you'd like to, to check this site, you can go to investorjunkie.com. So they have a purpose. Investor Junkie is your shortcut to financial freedom. We know that managing finances is not easy. We analyze and compare tools to help you make the best decisions. Okay, so basically they are money managers. Um, that's their point. That's their goal of their site. Hire us to do your money management. But there's many others out there. I could hire a bunch of other companies to do this. So what they've got to drive traffic is their blog, which they call Educate. You don't have to literally have your blog screen called blog. It could be called educate, it could be called news, it could be called articles. But here are articles on these various, what are these right here in, in WordPress parlance? What are these? We, we have tags and categories. In WordPress, we can create tags, and we can create categories. These are categories in WordPress on a topic. So this is the blog page showing these various blog categories. So let's just say I want to go look at investing. Click on that, and this shows me all the articles on that topic, category. When should you start investing? So there's an article there. Now, I teach at Southwestern College, and uh, oftentimes the student cohort that I get down there are students that are right out of high school. So I get like 18, 19, 20 year olds. And uh, when I teach uh, up here at North City, I often get people that are, you know, uh, coming here after work or have, have jobs and need to educate themselves more or are in retirement and such. 
So it's kind of interesting to see both sides of the coin that I, that I get of students, uh, those just starting off their education and those in continuing education. And I often take a moment in those classes to talk a little bit about this to the younger students, about investing and retirement, and they look at me with blank stares because, you know, that's way too early to think about retirement. But I do a little exercise where we take everyone's birth year and we add 65 to it because that's when you might think about retiring. So, you know, it's funny because then I see, well, the range of, of birth years, the, this class that just finished uh, last week, the, the oldest student was born in 1986 and the youngest student was born in 1996. So, you know, very, very young, very far away from their retirement. But we say, okay, take that year, you know, 1996 plus 65, and that comes out to a date in the future that you will most likely reach one day. 65. In the year 2061 is when I tell them you're going to retire, possibly. So for a lot of people that sounds so far away, unfathomably far away, the year 2061. Well, I remember the year 2000 sounding so far away, and that was 17 years ago. So I tell them, think about these concepts, you're going to retire one day, and if you start investing early, and, um, you know, some of them, it sticks for some people and some it doesn't. But I bring it up because there's a lot of great articles on this site, on this topic. I recommend this website a lot to people uh, about money and finance and investing and all of that. It's a website that has a lot of traffic because of the content. They're trying to sell their services as money managers, but maybe I can do it myself if I educate myself if I read these concepts. So this author on this website wrote this article, Content to Drive Traffic Back to the Site, to accomplish the goal of, well, it seems complicated, maybe I'll hire them. So I'm trying to say all of that for your own business. If I'm a realtor, if I'm a uh, lawyer, if I'm a restaurant, if I'm a public speaker, I want a website. I want traffic to my website to complete the goal of selling the product, booking a, um, you know, booking booking a speaking engagement, and all of that. So it's the content. That's what my handout is also going on about. So content, content, content is what helps your site get traffic. This financial site has various categories, various topics. It's not about one thing over and over. It's not just about what to do. You know, it's not talking always about uh, one topic. It's a variety of concepts, my handout. If you're going to write articles for, a, for some length of time, you want to develop a concept of what you're writing about in variety. I'm a realtor. I'm trying to get hired to sell houses. But I'm going to develop a concept. Maybe I'm going to write articles for first-time home buyers. So I'm going to have a variety of types of articles you know, about what are articles about the getting the loan, uh, where to search for the properties, pitfalls in buying your first house, so variety. And I have a note here, number four, about doing it yourself or getting other people to help you write your blogs. Uh, I'm busy running my business, and now I've got to write articles, too. I've also got to go on social media. Well, that's why there are companies that do this. You can hire a social media manager. You can hire, you know, blog writers. You can hire marketers to do this because I'm busy running my business. That, of course, means you're investing, you're paying people to do that. If you learn on your own or take these classes... Uh, it'll it'll definitely help you. When I mentioned the classes that I teach, there's all of these classes that are related to each other that I recommend people take. 
you took this class to make a website, hopefully in the future you'll take my SEO class, you'll take my social media class, you'll take my blogging class. I designed all those classes in that way because it's a lot of information. And you can come in and out of those classes at any time and take them multiple times. It, uh, it helps for it to stick. So there's some planning that happens before you, before you write your blogs. Does that make sense? Any questions on this planning section? The actual writing, I have 10 points here to consider. First of all is frequency. People always ask, okay, you sold me on blogging, but how often should I do it? Um, I have here, no matter your schedule, the important thing is to blog consistently. You can do once a month. Once a month, write an article on your website. You could do it once a week, once a day. There's no wrong answer except for never. You know, not doing it. That's the wrong answer. Not writing your blogs. Maybe you do it once a once a quarter. I think that's way too long in between. I think once a month is the minimum uh, that you would consider. So then the next question is, okay, if I'm going to do it once a month, how much should I write? One possible answer, a hundred words, which you'll see that you'll be able to write that pretty quickly depending on your topic. So more words is more better, right? 300 words. 500 words, 1,000 words, more words are better for, for, you, for the content you're creating to help you get found. But more words is more difficult. That's why backing up to the previous one, maybe I'm going to write an article once a month, but I'm going to hire someone else to write one every two weeks. So this content appears on a regular basis. These websites with the most traffic often write content every day or multiple times a day. Did you, did you notice uh, the dates, like on Social Media Examiner, June 1st, May 31st, May 30th, 29th, so very often, almost every day, they skipped one day there, 27th and 29th, but they're writing something very often. Grace Duffy wrote that one. Uh, Mary Smith wrote that one, Michelle Krasniak wrote that one, Paul Ramondo wrote that one, and Kyle Chown. So people, there's a bunch of writers, most likely hired to write articles for this site. You may think about that as well, hiring people to write for you, uh, or doing some sort of service-for-service -service trade. Let's say I'm a bakery and I want someone to write for me, so maybe I'll pay them in cookies. They'll get a batch of cookies or they'll get you know some of these cakes for, for writing. I have that kind of agreement. Uh, I have a client that they have a, a comic book shop, and one of my hobbies is comic books. So I write monthly an article for their comic shop, and I get a discount on comics. So I'm kind of paying them, aren't I? So the frequency, the length, are things you can define. The more of it that you do, uh, the better, because it's more content for the search engines to find. Title and description. In WordPress, we saw there's a box to write a title for your article. There's a box also for a description once you install Yoast. You have that snippet that you can write. These are a couple of things that are very important to craft because when you search on any search engine, let's say um, how to use mastodon.social, this is another social network. Uh, have you heard of the social network Mastodon? Uh, it, was, it was created last October, and it got a lot of buzz in April. Uh, it's not going to be a Facebook killer. It's not really designed for that. It's like a version of Twitter, um, and it has some other nuances. It also got popular uh, in the sense that it is 
trying to create a more civil community than Twitter, where things can easily uh, go negative with flame wars and, and bigotry and all of that. So, like the charter of Mastodon is a little bit more, some might say restrictive, others might say more civil, in that it's not accepted, you know, you'll get kicked out of it for bullying and all of that. So, Mastodon. There's a search term I did, how to use Mastodon.social. There's 665,000 results. The number one result is a blog that I wrote right there on my site. Um, higher than this one, The Verge. They're a very big website with a lot of traffic. My article in this instant is higher. Maybe not always because of various factors. But the video that I created also is listed right here. This was found because of the keywords and the content. This is what someone would type, or a variation of what someone would type. And if I type it in different ways, how to use Mastodon social network for business. It's a different result. Beginner's Guide to Mastodon, the hot new open source network. So the title of your article, the keywords and description in your article that helps you get found. Figuring out what to title it and how to describe it that's a little more complex, takes a little bit more time, takes market research, which is my other handout that we'll look at in a moment. Images are important for your blogs. People always ask me, uh, what kind of images can I use? Can I, can I just <coughs> copy someone's image from their website? And uh, really, you should avoid that. You should avoid using other people's graphics. Uh, obviously, don't go to some other website and do right-click save. Don't borrow their graphic. Even if you say, well, I'm just going to give them credit on my site. You never know. With some people, giving them that credit is enough. And for others, no. You need to pay me to use my photo. You might think, well, I'll go to Google and just do an image search on Google and take that photo of that, of that item. Again, I wouldn't trust that because images are copyrighted. The default of any... Thing, anything really that you create and put online, technically it's copyrighted. Someone created it, it's copyrighted to that person, technically, even if it doesn't have the copyright symbol or watermark on their photo. So worst case scenario is that the photo that you borrowed from Google, you used it on your site, and then you get a letter uh, saying, you know, please remove my picture from your site. Even, even worst case scenario is that you get a letter from the lawyer saying there are damages here and damages in the law means you owe money so they're going to charge you on that okay well worser case scenario is that they then take you to court because you stole their photo you know people can say yeah this phone here yeah it's worth five hundred dollars yeah this phone is worth seven hundred dollars this phone is worth x amount of money because it's tangible it's technology it's glass and and metal and it's technology people accept that this is worth hundreds of dollars. People don't accept that a photo is worth hundreds of dollars, that a song is worth hundreds of dollars. Even like things like a font. I've seen fonts, professional fonts, the style of the words, that cost two thousand dollars. You can buy a font that is worth more than your computer <laughs> because they are intellectual property. This is a tangible property that obviously has value, but digital things have a value too. All of that is to hopefully scare you into not using the images that you get off of Google or someone's website. You want to go to the right websites that focus on the safe images. Yes? I know someone who was using Getty images on his website and he got a letter from Getty asking for $5,000. Oh, wow. There you go. It happens. There was probably metadata in there that Getty can keep track of, and then they found their site, and then, you know, I thought, well, I'll just rename it. It used to be called Cats123, and I'll name it to Pets576. There's probably still metadata that is searchable. They got found. Yeah. Okay. 
So there's anecdotally right there, and I've heard it from other people too. So don't do searches online and simply borrow the graphic. The credit is not going to be enough. I have here a link to a website that focuses on royalty-free images, that focuses on images that are safe for you, that you don't owe anyone anything, and you can use them for whatever purpose. Some websites will give you the picture, but then it'll say for non-commercial use. So that means I can't use it on my website I'm trying to make money off of. Commerce. So Pixabay is definitely... Pixabay is definitely one that I would recommend. You're not going to get millions of results like the search engines, but out of the hundreds that are there, let's see, real estate. So there's a lot of good ones. Professional photos. I chose, I search real estate and I only get 717 results instead of 717 million I would like I would get on a Google search or search on Yahoo or Bing or whatever I only get 700 but there's a lot of good ones and I can rest assured that these photos are high quality they're public domain meaning basically free for commercial use no attribution you don't have to even give credit can download them in a variety of sizes, qualities. Oftentimes when you do a search on a regular search engine, you get low quality photos. Have you ever been to a restaurant and you look at their menu and some of the photos look blurry? Well, that's because they used a graphic that was really low quality, not enough for print. A graphic looks really nice on a monitor, but when you print it, it often can be very low quality. Pixabay gives you these different versions. Some of these are super high quality that you can print like poster size. Not just for my website, but as a big poster for the business. So that note right there on images is use images that are safe for you to use. We saw when we worked with pages and posts that there were various formatting options we could choose. One of them is headings. You can select some text and set it as a heading. We have heading one, two, three, four, up to six. You want to use headings in your blog posts. If I zoom out far away to this, you can't read it. But you can hopefully tell that there are sections that are divided by a heading. This is a section of something that's divided here. There's another one and another one. Those are headings. And that's very useful for SEO, for ranking. The search engines pay attention to that. It tells the search engine that you know what you're doing. It's not just a big wall of text. It's divided into chunks. I set this as a heading. This is another heading. You can see it in the example over here. When should you start investing? Things are going to pop out. Determining the factors. There's plain text, plain paragraph text. There's heading text, heading one, for example. Here's another one. Here's a subheading. When should you start investing? Here's a use case scenario or a, an example, Jen. Here's one for Rodrigo. Here's one for Michelle. More subheadings. So remember to mute your devices, please. So headings to divide up the content will help your SEO. Part of uh, your content, depending on what you're writing, the strategy is using lists like bullet points or numbered lists to go to put some kind of order. You can see that here also on the right side. 
this is a number, this is an order. You want to do these things in this order. You don't want to jump to this one first before doing this. So organization, even things like that, uh, bullet points and all of that, uh, help your, your SEO because this shows the search engines that you can write well and create good content that people are going to search for and help you find. This is uh, another important aspect, links. If you look at most of these articles, they have a link to something else. There's a spot here. Um, having a fully stocked emergency fund and an accessible savings account is a huge financial priority. So you know, studies show that you know people are like one disaster away from bankruptcy. And they don't have enough set aside just in case. So I'd like to learn more about that. There's a link that goes off to another article. This is a link on to their to one of somewhere else to their own site. One article of theirs linked to another article of theirs. Thus keeping people on their site longer. That's part of that way to achieve the goal. As I read more of these articles, maybe I finally decide, let me give them a call. Let me reach out to that free consultation. Uh, let me hire them. If I was a realtor and writing a variety of articles about pitfalls for the home, first home, first time home buyer, the longer people are on my site, the more they can decide, well, maybe they know what they're talking about. I'll call them. I'll hire them. I'm Victor's Bakery. The longer I keep them on my site, making them hungrier, hopefully then I then convince them to click to buy the cupcakes. So you want to have links. There's internal and external. These links are internal links. They're pointing to other pages on the site itself. It's internal. An external link is a bit of a more complex process that we don't have a lot of time to talk about in this class, but we would in the other class, which is that if I link my article to someone else's article on some other site, that could give me a backlink, that could give me traffic back to my site, from their site to my site, if I link to their site first. Is that in your SEO class you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Yes. Organization is important for SEO, for blog writing, effective blog writing, basically putting your articles in categories and using tags. You saw this one was about investing, starting off investing, and it was in the section, it was in the category of investing. Other categories, real estate, other articles, Entrepreneurship. So if I look there, here's a bunch of articles on that on that topic. Uh, they've been organized into this. Is buying a franchise a good idea? Uh, how to get inspiring ideas for starting a part-time business. So this is the section I might hang out more and read these articles. I might not be interested really in uh, you know bonds and such asset allocation. I want to focus on topics that are interesting to me. They've been organized. Your, your, your traffic, your readers will appreciate that because uh, it uh, lets them focus on what they care most about. Read more. We, we, we did that. We we wrote an article, and then I showed you there's a button to activate Read More. Notice these don't have the complete article. Uh, when you're in a section here of investing, it only shows you a little bit of the article. This one doesn't really have a button that says Continue Reading or Read More, but it shows you a preview. You can click on the title and read more. You want to do that. It's not that every 500 word article is visible completely here. You have to you have to go you have to click to view the article. So 
There's a lot to consider when you're actually writing the blogging class. If you take that, we take a little time to do brainstorming and we figure out ideas for people, what they could write about. So I, again, I can kind of lead you to it and show you the tools, but what you do for yourself. So that's always the more complex part. But this is the section on on writing. Any any questions on that section? After you write, you also need to engage in some promotion. And I have listed social media here twice. There should be a way for people that visit your site to share to their social media. So if I go to Investor Junkie and I think this would be a great article for my uh, friends and family to see, I've got a button here. Let me share this to my Facebook. Let me share it to via email. Give me a way to, s to spread it to more people. So for yourself, you want that. And we saw to activate that, um, you need a you need to set up Jetpack on your site, and there's a button there to to um, activate social media. So one way to start promoting is let the people that come to your site help promote for you social media for them. On the opposite side, you have to also engage in social media, social for you. You have to share your own articles on your LinkedIn, assuming you have a LinkedIn, on your Twitter, assuming you have a Twitter, on your Facebook, etc. So you have to be active to reach your audience on your social media. It's not just, it's not just uh, if you build it, they will come. You have to also uh, promote yourself, so use your own social media. Comments are valuable. There's these articles, and most of them have a spot for you to for you to comment. Here's another example. Browneyebaker.com is about food. Best ever potato salad. You read that article. It has video, it has text, it has links, ingredients. And then look at that, it's got lots of shares. Very popularly shared on Pinterest, much more than Facebook. So this is why I can't say, you know, only use this network. In this case, Pinterest is the network that has worked really well for this site. Facebook second place in this third one, which is some site called Yum. I haven't heard of that one. Curious, what is this site about? Yumly, your recipes are waiting. Connect to customize your recipe discovery. It's like a social network all about recipes. Now you're cooking recipes from the web's best foodies. So there's a network for everything. Maybe you'll get some examples here for our next potluck. <laughs> but there's social media. People can come here, share. They are promoting themselves on their own social networks, and they have also the ability for people to comment. There's 161 comments here. The way this works for your own self-promotion is like this. Let's look at these look at these comments for a moment. Um, Michelle and Katrina are doing it right and Brittany and Sylvia are not. What do you think they did right? Sylvia and Brittany wrong, Katrina and Michelle right. What do you think they did right? That's a little helpful, sure, but it's not really their text or anything. Notice if I hover my mouse over Katrina's name, that is an active link going to her website, warmvanillasugar.wordpress.com. There's a link back to her WordPress site. 
embedded in her name. Same with Michelle. I can tell it's underlined. This, underlined. this goes over uh, to Michelle. Well, this is someone else that works on the site, Dr. Brown and Baker. But Sylvia doesn't have an active link on her name. Put my mouse on it. It doesn't say it's going to go to any site. Scrolling through more comments. Okay, in this case, Ruth. So her name links her back to bread and milk and blackberries.blogspot.com, a link back to her website. She's piggybacking on the popularity of someone else's website to bring traffic back to her website. That's that aspect of marketing as well. I'm a realtor. I'm going to go to websites, maybe about banking or finance or something, and comment on people's articles there and have a link back to my website. That could get me more traffic. Yes? The ones that allow you. So you have to do the research to find the website where you can comment. And you usually see it like this. Like on this one, uh, it's right here. Leave a reply. I'm about to comment here. Name is required, email is required, website is optional. I'm going to say not optional. Always put your website there and that will activate your link back to your site. So that's how all of these that did it right did it. They commented, they filled in their name, their email to verify, and then they put in their web address. In this case here, Puppy Dogs didn't. Puppy Dogs just made a comment, but then there's no link back to their website. Kim did it right. Kim is getting a link back to cookiecrazedmama.blogspot.com. The food hound. Food dash hound dot blogspot. So uh, that's what my comment here is. Okay, you've written your, your you've written your articles and all of that. That still doesn't guarantee you traffic. You have to do some promotion. Here's more aspects of promotion and marketing. So you go off to comments on other people's website, and you comment, and that gives you a link back. Now the problem, of course, is if it's a good website, they are moderating the comments. They are checking the comments that they're on topic. It's their website. They can manage it however they want. So what they could do is, I don't like that comment. It's way too self-promotional. So they remove your comment. And that's okay. It's their website. They chose to do that. Just like you can do that on your own website. So try not to be completely self-promotional. Contribute something. Uh, so over here, my friend is having a barbecue Friday night and I was going to use Ina's potato salad recipe. I must forward this to her. So she's on topic with that reply not completely self-promotional. Her link is her promotion. Um, instead of putting her link directly on her text, that's often going to get your comment removed. It's too self-promotional. You have to be judicious on how you comment to get a link back. And then the last bit of promotion here is this uh, guest blogging. You can write articles on someone else's site. Not comments, articles. That takes the effort of setup and the agreement and the contract to figure out, OK, I'm going to write a, an article for you every month. You're going to pay me X amount of dollars. Or I'm going to write on your site. I get to put in links back to my site, on your site, or you're going to pay me in cupcakes, you know, whatever agreement you have that you write articles on someone else's site. Guest blogging. Uh, the people that write, like on Investor Junkie, let's see who wrote this one. Kara Perez. Uh, she wrote that one. Uh, if I click on her name, she's got more articles and also, in her case, 
oh, right here. She's the founder of bravelygo.co. So she's got a her address there. That can get her more traffic back to her site. She's <coughs> guest blogged on her on she's guest blogged on a popular site to get traffic back to her site. Let's take a quick look there. Bravelygo.co. Bravely seeks to connect women and money through online tools and in person financial literacy events. So there's a goal to the site, there's articles on the site, resources and freebies on social media as well. Interestingly here I see that on social media this site is on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. I don't see a link to Facebook. So the audience cultivated on this site for these networks must be good here. 1,235 followers on Twitter. 543 on Instagram. Hundred and seventy three on Pinterest. For so for that company it looks like the most effective one has been Twitter. Now this one says the motto of the site uh, seeks to connect women and money through online tools. So you might think, well, uh, they might then have the best results on Pinterest. I said earlier that Pinterest, the demographic of Pinterest, seems to be women, but in this case, it didn't seem to connect. So you never quite know which is the network that's going to be the best one for your business. They're trying all of them, or some of the big ones, and then they're seeing which one works. So these concepts in that handout are starting points uh, for blogging. The importance of blogging, I, I keep saying again, it's your content, how to write, what to write. You should really take the blogging class for that. We can talk a little bit one-on-one -on -one during the lab and such, but this is a general checklist. The more of this that you do, the more possibility of having effective blogs and content for you to get found. So I give you that handout. Uh, to hopefully help you. Any any questions on the on the handout in general? Yes. Um, if you have a blog with say five hundred people and you don't feel that's enough traction, if you decide to pull out and go to another platform, do you recommend that or you know just dump it basically? 500, uh, I mean, well, it could be yeah. a thousand. I don't, I don't know what that number is. But say you're, you're not satisfied, you've done some things, and you really not meet your, your target demographic of that. Does, but, does beating that, you know, if you dump that, you're losing those, those people. Mm -hmm. Unless you can bring them across. Which is often difficult yeah. for people to move from one place to the other. I, that's not. That doesn't happen as much as we would like. Uh, so there's still other factors to help answer that question. Like, did, were were you you had you didn't have enough traffic, let's say, but were you also engaging in social media or other? Well, things? you're just taking these steps. You're taking this not, into account. Okay. And you're just not maybe say say you were, you were hoping for five thousand and you only got a thousand, and now you've got these thousand. You're saying, well, maybe I should go to Mastodon or something mm -hmm. like that, and you. That's that's hard to answer. The hypotheticals you you you're, you're giving me good hypotheticals. I just still would be difficult to to give that answer. I would personally lean toward trying to build what you have okay. rather than trying to start over because you're pu you're pu pushing that boulder up the rock up the cliff again. So if you got this far, it's not enough. You could work harder 
with what you have. At least it's a starting point. Because from what I've seen in ex first-hand experience is that uh, you know popularity breeds popularity, traffic breeds traffic. What, what you're doing now does help you in the long run. And maybe your long run is longer than you think, but it's there eventually. I believe starting over isn't isn't as valuable. Uh, you know, you're, you're starting a brand new network, or you're trying to develop a new website or link or new people. You're, it's just always hard to start from scratch. So I would not would start you over. Just adding another one. Say, if you keep the one you've got, you keep doing it, then you could just add another one. Yeah, maybe cut down on the one that's not quite working. I would definitely first take into account the statistics of all of the networks that you're on, mm -hmm. and the ones that is getting more. Maybe focus. A little bit more just on that one, and then maybe try another one too. But all of these networks, even your own website and all of that, gives you stats to tell you what's working. And based on what's working, you can try to do more of what's working or give you an idea of what to do tangentially to try to build more. Like, for example, on YouTube, uh, the YouTube app on the phone is slightly different than on the computer. There's a screen on the YouTube app that gives you a really great screen that tells you what were the keywords that people searched for to find your video. And I have not found that stat on the website. I don't know if I, if I haven't found it in all their 50 pages, but I, you see it easily on the YouTube app. Based on that, it gives me ideas. Let's make more videos on these keywords. I can't find that on the, on the website, but it's in there in the app. So based on your stats, decide what to do. So the best answer about what to do for a person is check all your stats, all your insights to make a decision on what's going to work best, a business decision that's going to work best for your business. Do I just have one question that is bothering me from the first day since I didn't attend the class. Mm -hmm. But I was trying to understand from the video. We were working on the web. And you took it from WordPress.org, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And how come this is still .com? Whenever you get the software of WordPress.org, well, when you go to WordPress.org, all that they give you there is the software. You download it, and you have to install it somewhere. Mm -hmm. So our website is not on .org. It's my website example that's still there from the other day, vmcinc.net slash vbake because I bought that account at GoDaddy. So all I did at .org was to download the software, read the manual, but then I have to set it up on Bluehost or HostMonster. Some of the examples that we saw here of, of writers, some of them still had it at WordPress.com. Maybe it's working out for them because WordPress.com is free right here. The mailbaker.wordpress.com they still have it on WordPress.com because it's totally free. GoDaddy and Bluehost and all those are not free. But maybe that's enough for them to get their traffic and get accomplish what they need to. You know, write their blogs, get hired, whatever they're trying to do. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions on this uh, checklist? Okay, I've got another handout. We'll look at it right after our break. We'll talk a little bit of marketing strategy. Uh, we'll we'll look at um, we'll look at the client marketing strategy handout right after the break. So it's eight oh six. We'll be back at eight sixteen, and then we can go on. <laughs>